a lot of us, a lot of us have seen deep begun injuries on call, and I'm sure a lot of the attendees here throughout their careers have also had some experience with these horrible injuries. So I just want to go into a little bit more depth about these injuries that we'll that inevitably see throughout our careers. So I, a little bit of review of eye trauma. Some estimates of the 1977. Uh, there's an estimated 2.4 million eye injuries of all types occur in the U.S. every year. Uh, these are all, all comers of eye injuries. Uh, about a 1 million Americans have permanent significant vision loss due to this injury, and 70, more than 75% of these individuals are monocularly blind from the injury. Uh, <coughs> eye injury is a leading cause of monocular blindness in the United States. Also, injury is the leading cause for eye-related hospital admissions. Uh, there is a high cost to these high, high for this high trauma, about three hundred million dollars annually, and also uh, interocular foreign bodies accompany uh, estimates from eighteen to forty-one percent of these open globe injuries. Um, another interesting aside is that medical legal liability, up to fifty-six percent of these trauma cases in ophthalmology are associated with uh, missed interocular foreign bodies. So this is something to really consider and make sure you take a good history when you come in a patient with eye trauma. Um, BB guns, ball bearing guns, um, we're all familiar with these, a lot of us had them as children. Um, I had one and uh, about 3.2 million of these uh, BB guns are sold in the United States every year. A lot of them are marketed as toys to children, they're sold in toy stores or sporting goods stores. 80% of these guns, um, just a little statistic about how these guns work. Uh, these muzzle velocities that these guns can shoot are about 350 feet per second, um, but about half of them have even higher velocities of about 500 to 900 feet per second of how they can fire. Um, this range of the muzzle velocities for these, they call them non-powder guns, actually overlap with those of traditional firearms. So they do have quite a bit of kick to them, um, especially when fired from close range. Um, there was a study that they did on pig eyes and they found that about 246 feet per second from 10 feet away was about the, the speed needed in order to penetrate the human eye. Um, <coughs> BBs are typically made of steel, they sometimes have a copper zinc coating, and a lot of these are magnetic. BB gun injuries, um, some estimate from about 30 years ago, air powdered, air powered guns responsible for over 22,000 of injuries treated in the ERs. Uh, these are injuries of all types to the entire body. Uh, over a thousand of these were eye injuries. Fast forward to 1999, 76% of all the people uh, with BB gun related injuries were treated in the US. Uh, were quite young, 19 years old or younger. Uh, <coughs> in year 2000, there was an estimated um, still over 21,000 injuries related to non-powder guns. So there's not really a big change in <coughs> the number of these injuries that are occurring despite everybody's best efforts to educate people about eye protection and uh, <coughs> policy changes on who can buy these guns. Um, <coughs> in terms of how the, BB gun, how the BBs actually injure the eye, it's a pretty small pellet, about three to five millimeters, and we saw with how the velocity is fired, and <coughs> the way it hits the eye is that it really uh, imparts a large conducive, conducive force on the globe. Uh, it's not a sharp object, therefore, the amount of force necessary to penetrate the eye is pretty high. Um, <coughs> the type of injuries we see are globe rupture with disruption of tissues and projectile path, intraocular form bodies. Um, this almost makes you think that the worst type of injuries that can occur are those that penetrate the eye and then the BB ricochets within the eye itself and causes even more damage than if it was just a through and through injury. Uh, again, optic nerve injuries, uh, people leading to optic neuropathies, optic atrophy, and then uh, the orbit, uh, lids, and then nexal structures. Uh, initial visual acuity does not correlate with the final visual acuity in several studies. I'll show you a study later that shows that many of the people that present with hand motions or light perception vision ended up with that poor of visual acuity at the end. But some of the studies that have been in the past did not show any correlation or significant um, association with initial visual acuity and final visual acuity. It was a study back in the 80s, um, a review of BB gun injuries, and they reported an enucleation rate of 86%, and that's very, very, very high. Um, all these remaining eyes had quite poor visual acuity past the legal, blind, bl legal blindness range. <coughs> um, as you can see, the enucleation rates range quite a bit in the literature. 
um, but you can think of maybe about 50 to, 50 to 60 percent as an average for the studies. Um, in 1991, Martin, a retinal surgeon, also did a series of, in his experience of all these perforating injuries that he had. These were all types of injuries, knives, <coughs> hammering on nails, metal on metal injuries, uh, pellet gun, shotgun, BB gun. And they actually found that BB gun injuries had the worst prognosis, had the, the worst prognosis in terms of all these penetrating injuries. Uh, this is from the Journal of Injury. Um, this is another series on <coughs> BB gun uh, <laughs> BB gun injuries, it's a journal I'd never heard of, but it's out there. Um, they found, this was back in 2011, they still found the visual prognosis was still very poor. Most of their patients ended up in the hand motions to light perception to no light perception range. Uh, but however, they did have a less frequent enucleation rate, about 15%. Um, they, they attributed this to modern surgical techniques and uh, vitrectomy and staged uh, repair of the globe. Here's a typical CT scan, um, just showing here of a pretty obvious intraocular foreign body. This is a stock photo I took off the internet. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a BB, but it, it, you could perceive it as probably a BB sitting right up against the retina, probably some hemorrhage in the vitreous as well. Um, this is a video taken on an iPhone from the OR monitor, but I just wanted to show you uh, a case. Sorry, it's kind of bloody for this early in the morning, but I just wanted to show you a case of a BB extraction just done recently with Dr. Bernstein. So this is late in the case when we had finally isolated the BB, uh, made a large corneal incision. That uh, tip on the right is a rare earth magnet that was used to lift the BB up, and this the lens loop taking uh, the actual BB out. So pretty impressive, and you can tell that there was, you know, that I had a very poor prognosis. So, brief review of interocular form bodies. Uh, you have organic versus inorganic materials. We think of organic materials like vegetative matter or wood that can be coming off a saw injury or something like that or a grinding injury. Uh, inorganic materials, all the metals you can think of. Hammering is a very uh, common uh, injury to have metal on metal, uh, weed whacker injuries, things like that. Uh, metals reported in about 60 to 88% per of intraocular form bodies, and up to 90% of these may be magnetic. So um, that's why we always have the earth, rare earth magnet available uh, in the OR if it's in the posterior uh, pole and we need to get the uh, form body out of there. Intraocular form bodies are found in the anterior segment in a minority of cases, but it just goes to show that there's an important aspect uh, of alternate imaging like anterior segment OCT and ultrasound to be able to detect these um, in, in the clinic. Um, there's a difficult view in a lot of these foreign body cases, as the residents and I know. Uh, a lot of them are associated with vitreous hemorrhage, and a lot of them do have traumatic cataracts, so you might not be able to visualize the foreign body at the slit lamp. Um, that just also proves that you do need to do um, imaging as a, a further step in your workup. Well, there's another study that showed that the entry site in the globe is only observed in about 86% of the cases. So. Even if the patient says, oh, nothing hit me, and they have a kind of a vague story of trauma, you really need to try to tease that out of their history to make sure that they, there's no possibility of an intraocular foreign body. And then if in doubt, always go to imaging. So just a brief run through the management of intraocular foreign bodies. Make sure to assess all of their injuries. A lot of these patients are, have been involved in pretty significant trauma, and they're being managed in the emergency room by, and being assisted by our emergency room doctors. So. The next step would be imaging. Um, a lot of these patients do have open globes with gaping wounds. Uh, primary closure of the, uh, of the open globe within hours is, uh, is paramount in these cases. Um, if endophthalmitis is present, uh, if they're presenting later, we may consider a tap and inject. Um, systemic antibiotics are recommended throughout the literature, tetanus prophylaxis, and then eventually a stage removal and repair of um, all the other injuries. Uh, traditionally, the intraocular foreign body management literature has said that <clears throat> it's an urgent or emergent um, case to be able to remove the foreign body in order to avoid anophthalmitis and other complications. Um, this view has been challenged. There's a, a study that I'll show you in a little bit here about uh, Iraq war veterans uh, experiencing uh, intraocular foreign bodies and how they manage that. So choices for imaging, CT scan. I, in my mind, I think this is the kind of go-to imaging. Um, they have a very high sensitivity. 
uh, it can detect up to 100% of metallic form bodies um, greater than 0.05 millimeters uh, in volume. Sensitivity is lower for non-metallic metallic material. Um, this can be mistaken for intraocular air, intraorbital air, if it's an organic material. Uh, plain films are not the imaging of choice anymore. They can miss a lot of these form bodies. Uh, another thing to consider, uh, as long as you don't put too much tension on the globe, uh, if it is open, is an ultrasound. Um, <coughs> it's definitely more user dependent uh, than the CT scan, but it can be quite sensitive in detecting these. Um, anterior segment OCT, like I mentioned, in select cases, if something is um, lodged in the angle or on the posterior surface of the cornea, you're not sure. Um, <coughs> this is a, there's an advantage to that because it's a non-contact scan, so you're not going to be um, expressing any intraocular contents uh, with that type of imaging modality. And then, of course, MRI is contraindicated because of the risk of this uh, metallic objects moving around within the eye, causing more damage. In terms of antibiotics, what we recommend um, <clears throat> is systemic antibiotics administered before or during intraocular uh, foreign body removal. The third generation fluoroquinolones like Leviquin, Levofloxacin, have been shown to have superior intraocular penetration after systemic administration, and also prophylactic intravitreal. Uh, antibiotics such as vancomycin, ceftazidine, uh, have been used during surgery with low report, reported endophthalmitis rates. Some complications of these foreign bodies, endophthalmitis, is a wide, wide range in the literature, but up to 30% for retained foreign bodies. And that's why a lot of people pushed towards early removal because they don't want to, you know, promote an infection if it's a, a dirty, dirty foreign body. Retinal detachment, a lot of these patients present with uh, retinal detachment. Our patient that I showed you before had a total retinal detachment that was uh, unable to be repaired, unfortunately. Rates of proliferative vitreoretinopathy retinopathy are also cited in the literature and have a wide range of uh, incidents as well. Calcosis and siderosis from retained foreign bodies of copper and iron. Um, some people with intraocular foreign bodies presenting years and years down the road can present with a chronic smoldering low-grade uveitis or even a hypopion type uveitis. Um, <clears throat> so it's always something to consider on your differential diagnosis of somebody with a remote history of trauma as well. Um, and there's actually one report of acute retinal necrosis happening after a, a foreign body injury. And in the article, it doesn't really discuss if is this just a coincidence, but it seemed to occur right after the foreign body injury. So it's a pretty interesting um, thing that occurred after the injury. Here's an article talking about risk factors for ophthalmitis and retinal detachment. Uh, with these retained foreign bodies, um, they found that the increased risk for endophthalmitis was found in those that are non-metallic, so the organic type of materials. Those in the setting, if it was a dirty wound, someone was laying in a stream or a pond, um, <clears throat> longer time to presentation as well. <clears throat> Prophylactic intraventral antibiotics at the time of foreign body removal may lower the risk that they found, and also in, in terms of retinal detachment. They found it was associated with the posterior segment, intraocular the foreign bodies, obviously the, the entry site of the wound, and endophthalmitis and retinal impact sites. Here's the article that I was discussing earlier about uh, the Iraq uh, war veterans uh, that had eventually initially been treated um, for intraocular foreign body and open globe injuries. So the way that it worked is <clears throat> they had an injury out in the field. It was repaired primarily at the base in Iraq, um, all their injuries were stabilized and then they were eventually evacuated to Germany and then came back stateside to Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center. Um, the primary intervention that most of these patients had was a 3 port 20 gauge vitrectomy with foreign body removal through either a limbal or pars plane incision. The endpoints of the study were to look at the final vitrocuity, the rate of endophthalmitis and the rate of proliferative vitreoretinopathy. retinopathy. These are all questions in the literature as does an earlier removal of the foreign body prevent these devastating complications down the road? Um, in the study, the mean time of removal was actually 39 days, and you can think that that makes a lot more sense than somebody that's in Iraq that has to get flown back and has a lot of other injuries, maybe neurologic or uh, neurosurgical <coughs> injuries that need to be managed. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot longer than I would have expected. Uh, the mean preoperative visual acuity in this study was 2,400, and postoperative visual acuity is actually a lot better than, than uh, some other previous studies, was 20 over 120. Uh, they had no reported cases of sympathetic ophthalmia, endophthalmitis, or siderosis from these retained foreign bodies, even after an average of 39 days. Um, they had a lower rate of NLP or nucleated eyes, about 10%, and 
and um, they also, the main, um, most common regimen for systemic antibiotics was Leviquin and topical Vigamox for about seven to 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Were they doing the uh, no removal of the foreign bodies in Germany or where were they? So they, Germany was kind of like a staging area for them to get them back eventually to Walter Reed. I think if they had the ability to have a retinal surgery surgeon there, they would do it there, but I think most of the cases were done at Walter Reed. So the results of this study, they found that post-operative visual acuity was associated only significantly with the extent of intraocular injury. All these other factors, the initial <coughs> visual acuity, where it entered, the type and size of foreign body, the source of it, whether you use eye protection or not, and the time to extraction did not play significantly in terms of post-operative visual acuity. Um, in terms of the PVR rates, the only significant association found was the extent of intraocular injury and or presenting visual acuity with the rates of PVR. Um, all those other factors I mentioned before were, were not statistically significant in terms of how much PVR forms in these patients. So the conclusions of this Iraq study, um, delayed intraocular foreign body removal with combined systemic and topical antibiotics that can result in good visual acuity outcomes without an increased risk of endophthalmitis or PVR is what we can see. Um, as long as primary closure is within hours like we do here in the middle of the night and then stage a repair of the uh, intraocular injuries at a later time, there's no real advantage um, seen to early intraocular foreign body removal. So a lot of us on call, if we have an intraocular foreign body, it's an open globe. I think the be better thing to do is to close it and then plan late at a later time for removal of a foreign body or repair of a you know, retinal injury, things like that. So future directions in um, intraocular foreign body removal. I'm gonna show you a video real quick of a technique. It's about a minute long. So it's called the viscoelastic capture technique. Um, I'm just gonna kinda talk through it a little bit here. So basically this patient had a intraocular the foreign body sitting back on the posterior vitreous that they had to retrieve. You can see the CT scan there that's sitting right up against the retina. And this was penetrated through the cornea. There's a large laceration here. It's kind of hard to tell on the video. So they just do primary repair. They put in another trocar. Be able to do the vitrectomy. make their corneal incision, that's the site in which they're going to remove the foreign body. And that's a you know fairly small incision that they're doing. So it obviously depends on the size of the foreign body you're, you're removing. And they go ahead and take the lens out. They go in, they can see the foreign body. Do some treatment. This is where they go ahead and inject disco visc into the anterior chamber. And this uh, disco visc actually acts as a, a medium for the foreign body to be suspended in. So when you bring the foreign body up, um, depending on the weight of it and the, and the uh, components of the viscoelastic you use, the foreign body can actually just be suspended in there. You don't have to switch hands to, to remove the foreign body. You can just take it out from there with forceps. So there's a little diagram of how it's suspended there, which is right about at the pupil level. Captured in the anterior chamber, and then ex eventually extracted through the wound. There we go, okay. Um, there's also another technique in the literature it's called the triple see-through technique. So a uh, little bit similar, they do, um, they take the lens out, and they make a posterior capsulorexis, and then they eventually take it out through the, the posterior capsule, anterior capsule, and then through the corneal incision. Um, <clears throat> there's also one, one last thing is in the literature, they've done some experimental studies about silicone oil and viscoelastic used um, posteriorly to cushion the force of, if you end up picking up the form body and then dropping it in the middle of the case to kind of cushion and prevent any iatrogenic uh, injury, any further injury to the retina. So conclusions from what I, I gleaned from all these BB gun injuries and looking at all these bad pictures, um, they'd still have a very, very grim prognosis. However, the uh, 
rate of enucleation has seemed to drop in the years, so at least saving the eye itself has um, improved with uh, modern surgical techniques. Uh, also, delayed foreign body removal does not worsen prognosis or increase complication rates. It's also something to consider um, during the middle of the night. And uh, what I think is needed is education to patients and parents about how dangerous these weapons are and that they're being sold at toy, toy stores and things like that. And uh, eye protection is obviously a thing to counsel your patients about if uh, their kids are going to end up playing with these type of toys. All right, that's it. Dr. Kagan. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them did have a lot of more serious injuries, you know, intracranial bleeds and uh, limb, limb injuries and things like that. So they had to be delayed, um, but a lot of them didn't. And uh, it, was, it was interesting that they had actually zero cases of anophthalmitis out of about 70, 77 foreign bodies. Tom? Uh, I do not think so of that because there isn't really an explosion that comes out of the barrel of the, the gun, a BB gun. Um, so I don't think that the metal's heated up to the point where it'd be sterilized. And yeah, you're right. A lot of the IEDs, they do consider those to be sterile, but they have actually seen some uh, reports of anophthalmitis even with those IED explosions. So it's hard to tell exactly what was in those and you know what gets into the eye. Jim. Yeah, and actually, airsoft rifle guns aren't as bad as BB guns. And obviously, it's a plastic pellet. More of the injuries are hyphema and things like that, and iridodialysis, and more anterior segment type injuries. They aren't as devastating. The visual acuity uh, in the reports is a lot better uh, postoperatively in those, I mean, more in the 2100 2040 to 2040 range. So. Dr. Bernstein. You know, it's always <coughs> difficult to decide. Thanks.